Bible Bus is on the road again, traveling now through the small and mighty New Testament book of 2 John. Welcome to Through the Bible. And as we travel along, our teacher, Dr. McGee, reminds us of the dangers of extremes. Now, we all know about them in politics, but the same is true for those in the faith. Some Christians practice extreme liberalism in how they interact with the world, while others believe that strict fundamentalism is the only way. Well, the Apostle John warned his first readers of these tendencies, and his practical counsel is just as relevant today. So how do godly people live in this world? Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard as we turn our attention to this important discussion from the book of Second John. Now, as you find your seat, Greg Harris is with us, and he brought along a few really good letters that we've recently received from our fellow passengers. Yeah, Steve, I mean, I know I'm always excited, but I am extra excited today because we're going to focus on a very, very special part of our listening family. Now, remember, John was a senior citizen, quote unquote, when he wrote this letter. Yeah. He was one of the he was the last living disciple of Jesus. It had been over 50 years since he'd walked with Jesus. And so what we want to do today is read some letters of people that have been on the Bible bus a long time. And I, I so appreciate these folks. So you want to jump in with sure. this first one? This is Margo in Tennessee. Having been on and off the Bible bus since I was a young mother and wife, I praise my Lord and Savior by thanking you for all that you do. Now that I am an old woman of 70 years and retired, I listen daily by Internet. When you started the World Prayer Team, I joined, and it has been a true and powerful experience for me. Way to go, Margo, by the way. (laughs) I am in awe of our Lord's real and present work in touching hearts around the world today. I rejoice with you when a Muslim discovers Christ Jesus, when an Ethiopian finds the peace that only he can give, and I realize daily how our Lord is working to bring all people to the saving knowledge of him. Wow. So special. Thank you, Margo, so much. Now we have Mark in Washington who wrote this. I first hopped aboard the Bible bus nearly 30 years ago. It was a difficult time in my life, and I was searching for answers. Your program made a huge difference in my spiritual journey. I listened and learned so much about God's Word. This teaching was instrumental in my walk of faith. It helped me through my college life, my marriage, raising kids, and now getting ready to retire and watch my kids on their journey. I recently started listening on my iPhone app. I love this. Anytime, any place. How awesome is that? Hope to be on the bus another 30 plus years. I pray several times a day for your program and enjoy hearing about how God is changing the world through his word, one life at a time. Wow. Wow. And as I look back, you know, Mark has been on the bus for 30 years, and that's about how long I've been announcing. And as he read through the different transitions in his life, I think those are the same ones that I've had. It, me and I'm too. looking forward to it. Me so. too. It was about 30 years ago that I first came into contact with TTB, and I met yeah. you. And we've, we've, even though I'm slightly older than you, not much, not yeah. much, but yeah. you remind me of that. But yeah, we have journeyed through all those stages of life. I had the same thought, Steve. Yeah. This is a, another one. I think we've got time. This is Jamie in Virginia. I became a Christian at the age of four and have been listening to through the Bible since the early 70s. I even had the opportunity to meet and speak with Dr. McGee in person a number of times during my teens. The program was a source of light and strength through my childhood, college education, marriage, and parenting three children. And now, as I work to serve families in crises and move toward retirement, you are still feeding me daily. I find as the world grows darker, I need you more than ever before. Through every possible up and down joy and sorrow, you have been there every day. Your proclamation of truth bolsters my foundation and my courage. I praise God for you and pray for you. Thank you all for faithfully carrying the good news to the whole world, but especially to this sinner saved by the blood of Christ and fed daily by his word. Until we meet someday in the presence of our Lord and Savior, his blessings and protection be upon you. <clears throat> I didn't think you were going to make it Man. through that letter. We were getting pretty emotional in here. Baby. It is. It, it is. No, it's. You have a good heart, Steve, and and these letters touch our heart. And we want to say thank you to everyone for for sticking with us. Yes. And we what we also know about these folks, even though they may not have said it explicitly, is they're praying for the ministry through the Bible. And one of them did say he prays several times a day. And listen, we could not do it without you. So thank you. Yeah, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we uh, 
journey into Second John today. I pray that you would teach us what each of us needs to hear through your Holy Spirit, that we would see with clear eyes, that you would give us understanding, and that you would continue to bless both the listeners in the U.S. and around the world uh, through the ministry of Through the Bible, and that you would continue to be glorified in this ministry and through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, last time we were looking at the two words that John, in his second epistle, emphasized. One, of course, is the word truth, and that has to do with love also, love in the truth. And as we said before, that these two words, actually, they are welded together in the person of Christ. He's the epitome of both. He is the truth. And he is God, and God is love. Therefore, he is love. Therefore, we have these two words. And as we spoke last time, that sound doctrine is all important. In fact, when we get to the third epistle, John's going to startle you in that third epistle. And, well, he's going to startle you here in the second epistle. He's going to tell us that We are not even to entertain a false teacher. We're not to have fellowship with them at all. Now, that's fine and well and good enough. I'm sure that most of you who listen to this program would be called conservative. I do hear from several liberals that listen to us, and I don't know why, but they do, and they write us, very frankly, rather unusual letters, and we're delighted that they listen. But I'm very candid to say that the jungle today of liberalism is a dangerous jungle to walk in. Now, there's the other side of the pathway that you and I as Christians walk today. And on the other side is the wilderness of extreme fundamentalism because there are rattlesnakes out there and other venomous and poisonous creatures And you have to be very careful. And as we said before, we have learned over the years that God's men today who stand for the truth and preach the truth of God, I've found by and large are men you can depend upon. As I said last time, and I want to repeat it again, these men, I've never heard them attempt to separate brethren. I've never heard them try to wreck or ruin the ministry of another brother at all. And I have found them, by and large, men could be depended upon. And they were men that were very gracious in their manner. I remember hearing this story of the late Dr. Harry Ironside. He was holding a conference in one of these conference centers. And you know, a great many people, as I've heard him say, they go to these summer conferences for just one purpose, to compare one speaker to the other speaker and to try to set up some sort of a conflict. And he said that this man came to him one day, and at least I heard this. He did not tell this to me at all. I heard it about Dr. Ironside when I went to a certain conference myself. And I found there that they attempted to compare you with the last speaker, and then the next speaker coming along would be compared to you. That was the way they did it. And that's a conference that, I very seldom go to. They don't invite me very often if you want to know the truth because I don't like that method at all. But anyway, this man came to Dr. Ironside and said to him, Dr. Ironside, Dr. So-and-so, who was here last week, he said so-and-so, and today you said the very opposite. Now, which is correct? Now, it was on a minor point of doctrine. It was nothing that was vital, but it was a difference of opinion, as all of us have differences of opinion, but we can differ without being disagreeable. And so Dr. Ironside says, well, I didn't know that Brother So-and-so taught that. He says, that's quite interesting. He says, maybe I should look into that. I could be wrong. And he walked away, and the brother stood there with his mouth open because he surely couldn't get an argument there. May I say to you that I'm confident that Dr. Ironside never felt he was wrong, but he at least shut up the brother and kept him 
from trying to drive a wedge between brethren. Now, that is the thing that, in my judgment today, is more dangerous, actually, than liberalism is. I can spot a liberal, and I can say truthfully that I do not associate with them or fellowship with them. I have nothing in common with them. I've been accused falsely by the extreme viewpoint of fundamentalism that I fellowshiped with a certain bishop during a campaign here in Southern California. Well, to tell the truth, I never even met this man. I have no reason to. He and I are in two different businesses altogether, and I've never even met him. I have no fellowship with that. But I have found out that the most dangerous ones for me are the extreme fundamentalists. And I would say I'm more afraid of them, and I'm afraid of these that are a little different than the fine men who stand for the Word of God in the past and many today. And on the other hand, I've met others who prattle pious platitudes and claim that they had the truth. And woe unto the man who disagreed with them on minor matters, especially the matter of separation, as if that was the all-important matter. And their priorities were not doctrine, but assassination of character and name-calling on the lowest level. I have met both ministers and members of churches that I was actually more afraid of than a rattlesnake. The venom of bitterness and jealousy and hatred was dripping from their mouths as they feigned their love and devotion to Christ and to the truth. Therefore, the great message here of Second John is this. Truth walks in shoe leather, and if it does not, it's dangerous. It's dangerous, and we need to be very careful of both sides of the spectrum today of faith. Now, I want us, with that in mind, to come to John's second epistle. Now, we saw that in the first epistle that he was very strong. We call him the apostle of love. The Lord Jesus called him a son of thunder. And I want to tell you, I think you can add with the thunder a little lightning here in these epistles of John. He made it very clear that as far as a person is concerned, that you have to exhibit love for the brethren or you're not a child of God. Now, that may lead, you see, to folk today doing extreme things. There are certain ones, as we've seen, it's dangerous to put your arm around them because they may put a knife in your back, and it could be either a liberal or extreme on the other side, an extreme conservative. You find very little love, actually, in either group. Now, with that in mind, let's come now here to Second John, and I'm going to read the first verse. And here we are reading the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Now, this is the part of the introduction to this little epistle. In fact, the introduction here of this little epistle it takes in the first three verses to tell the truth and it's sort of like the tails wagging the dog here, such a long introduction for such a small epistle. But actually, it's a personal letter, and it's written by John to the elect lady. The Greek word is electa, and electa is really a title. It could be the name of the person, for that matter. And the question is often asked, does it refer to a Christian lady in the early church by the name of Electa. Well, it would seem that it was addressed to some lady in the church, or, as I prefer to interpret it, speaking now of interpretation because I'm not clear in my own thinking whether there was a lady by this name in the early church, 
or whether he is addressing the early church at that time. You must recall that John is the apostle who writes of the family of God. Paul writes of the church of God. And Peter writes of the government of God. And if you keep that in the background of your thinking, when you come to these epistles written by these different men, it will help you to understand many things they're saying. Now, regardless of whether it's an individual or a church, he is thinking of it in the context of the family of God. They're in the family of God. Now, apparently there was a woman who was extending hospitality to all those who claimed to be Christian, though some of them were actually heretics. They were denying the deity of Christ. They were denying the great truths of the Christian faith. And John warns here against entertaining such folk. And that actually is the purpose of this little epistle. And it gives now a balanced viewpoint of the first epistle. This idea of love, love, love today, that you're to love everybody that comes along, I don't find that in the Word of God. Now, God so loved the world, but he never asked me to love the world. In fact, I'm told love not the world, the things in the world. And I understand that to be the culture and the civilization, this man-made thing that man has set up in the world today and has come down through the centuries. But I also understand that God is not saying to me, I want you to build up some sort of a sentimental feeling toward the loss and love them and then bring the gospel to them. God says to me, as we saw in the book of Jonah, God says, I love them. I want you to give the gospel to them. And when you give the gospel to them, then you will learn to love them. That is the thing that is important. And I understand when he's talking about love. Yeah, I not only understand it, John's making it very clear. You're to love the family of God. You're to love other believers. Now, you're to love them in the Lord. Now, I think we need to be very careful about that love because a great many of these offshoots today of the hippie movement are interpreting agape love as nothing in the world but sex. A lady called me this morning, and she's been saved through the radio ministry, and she said to me, Dr. McGee, I just want you to know I love you. And then she sort of caught herself when she said that, and she says, and I hope you understand, I'm not talking about man and woman love. I'm talking about I love you as a brother in the Lord who led me to Christ. Well, I understand that. And I believe that's the kind of love that John's talking about here. Love in the family of God. And that needs to be exhibited today in the church. I think that there are times now for many churches that have built up a reputation of being fundamental in the faith. And I would say that it's time not to exhibit love among the brethren. I would say that I need that in my own life. I'm sure you need that in your own life. There are very few folk that actually question the fact whether I'm fundamental or not. The criticism I hear most in Southern California, they call me an extreme fundamentalist. I don't think I am, but that's what many say. That's what you are. But I don't worry about that. The thing that I do not worry about it, but I'm concerned about is that we love the brethren. That's important. But this thing can slop over. We need to recognize that it has boundary in the family of God. Now, who's in the family of God? Here comes along one of these heretics, as he did in John's day. He's apostate. He's actually antichrist. He denies the deity of Christ. And Gnosticism was coming up then in the church. You see, Peter and Paul were already dead and had been dead 30 years when John wrote these epistles. Gnosticism was beginning to come in. It actually denied the deity of Christ. Now John is saying, when one of those fellows comes along, you're not to extend love to him. You're not even to entertain him. And that's very important for us to see. And therefore, the theme of this epistle is for truth's sake, for truth's sake. 
when truth and love come into conflict, this is quite interesting. Truth is that which is the one that is to predominate. It is the one that has top priority. Did you notice that Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 didn't say, now abideth faith, hope, truth, and love. He just said faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. But when truth is brought in, then truth comes first. That's very important to see, all important to see. In other words, truth is worth contending for, and it is wrong to receive false teachers. Now, that's the position that I take very definitely. I think that the truth in the Word of God is worth contending for. And when I say truth, I mean that which is basic to the fact that this is the Word of God. No question in my mind about it. And the second thing, the deity of Christ and his work on the cross for us. Now, when I meet a man that's true on those essentials, then he and I can disagree on non-essentials. I have a very good friend. He's a Pentecostal preacher, and I played golf with him. And, and I naturally get into a friendly argument. And I always end up by saying to him, I said, Brother, you and I agree on so many things, and I love to hear you talk about the Lord Jesus and talk about his death on the cross. You thrill my heart when you talk, as I've heard you talk. But I said, Brother, I want you to know that you and I disagree on a few points, and I'm going to pray for you because I think you're wrong. <laughs> well, you know, he turns around and says the same thing to me, and we leave each other laughing. And as far as I know, that man has never said an unkind word to me or about me. He's my brother. I wish you could see it as I do, but it'll just have to be that way till he gets a little more light, and I want to be patient with him. But I want to tell you, he stands true on the inspiration of Scripture. He stands true on this matter of the deity of Christ. He stands true on the fact he died for me. Now, when a man does that, he's my brother, and I can't escape that. Now, even in this little epistle, I have made a threefold division. And love here is expressed in the boundary of truth in the first six verses. Love in truth. And then verses 7 through 11, its life is an expression of the doctrine of Christ. You will express what you're thinking. A friend of mine came up to me after I'd made that statement in the sermon. He says, there's an exception to that, Dr. McGee. And I said, what is it? He says, it's a woman driver. He says, when she puts out her hand signal, she's going to turn left, she turns right. He says, she doesn't always act like she's thinking. Well, may I say to you, many of the women I've met, they act like they think. And for that reason, action certainly reveals what you're thinking, what's in your heart. Now, personal greeting is in the last two verses, 12 and 13. False teachers are not to be received by the Christian, but true teachers are to be received with joy. Now, this makes this very lovely here. And I want to say just one other word before we go off the air today. And it's relative to another word here. It's the elder unto the elect lady. Now, the word is presbyteros. And presbyteros is presbyter. It has a twofold meaning. It could mean a senior citizen. It could refer to age. Or it could be a title referring to an office or a minister or a teacher. And candidly, I'm sure that John primarily just calls himself here an elder. Speaking of his office, he doesn't call himself an apostle. And I think he also infers the fact that he's now an old man. He's actually up about 90 years of age in the 90s, approaching 100 when he wrote this epistle. Now, this refers to John here. And now we have that much nailed down in the epistle. The elder, John, unto the elect lady, evidently an outstanding Christian woman who had been entertaining a few of the apostates, the Gnostics in the church. And John writes this warner that to love the brethren means not to love heretics at all. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
As we go today, please let us know if we can help you find either a Bible study resource that will deepen your personal study of God's Word or anything in our resources section. Just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And remember, you can always visit us at ttb.org or you can write to Through the Bible at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. If you listen in Canada, write to Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. May God bless you today as you set your heart and mind on things above. Jesus, may it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, be washed in white as snow. Join us each weekday for our five-year daily study through the whole Word of God. Check for times on this station or look for Through the Bible in your favorite podcast store and always at ttb.org.